everyone, and welcome to the journal webinar series of the American Society of Agronomy, the Crop Science Society of America, and the Soil Science Society of America. I'm Marie Johnston, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for the webinar entitled Transferability of a Large Mid-Infrared Soil Spectral Library. Before we begin, please know that your questions could be sent in at any time, and I'll help them, I'll funnel them to our moderator, Felipe. Also note that the webinar is recorded and the recording will be emailed to you after the session. You will be prompted also to take a quick four question, I promise it's fast, survey when the webinar is done. So now I'm happy to introduce our moderator for today, Felipe Alberto. Felipe is a technical editor for the Soil Science Society of America Journal. He is an assistant professor at Texas A&M. He also holds an adjunct position with the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Concepcion, Chile. Dr. Alberto takes an interdisciplinary approach to studying soil development, as well as the effect of land use change and management intensification on soil functionality. All right, so Felipe, it's all yours. You can introduce our guest today. Well, thank you. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Also a belated happy World Soil Day to everyone. And what better way to celebrate soils than with this very interesting webinar? We're excited to continue this monthly webinar series with features, the latest research published in our society journals. As Marie mentioned, please enter any questions in the question and answer section, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Jose Lucas Safanelli. Dr. Safanelli has a PhD in soil science at, from the University of Sao Paulo. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Woodwell Climate Research Center and works in the Soil Spectroscopy for Global Good Initiative. Today, Dr. Safanelli will speak about how we can use mid infrared spectroscopy to predict soil properties across different instruments. This webinar will demonstrate how we can improve the interoperability among mid-infrared instruments and spectral libraries for soil properties estimation. This information can help new laboratories build a spectroscopy capacity using existing MIR spectral libraries and support the global efforts to make soil spectroscopy universally accessible. The report was published in May, June 2023 issue of the Soil Science Society of America Journal. Dr. Safanelli, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. As Philippe said, my name is Jose. I'm postdoc working at Woodhill Climate Resource Center. And I'm very excited to be here today because we are celebrating the World Soils Days this week. And I believe that soil spectroscopy is a great technology for the 21st century and will help us to monitor soils, to assess soil health, and uh, ultimately contribute to uh, sustainable food production, combating the climate crisis, and many other things. So today, my presentation will be on a paper we published last year. Uh, this paper was made uh, with the collaboration from, uh, with my colleagues from Czech University of Life Science Prague, World Agroforestry, University of Wisconsin Madison, and a colleague from USDA, <clears throat> NRCS Kellogg Soil Sur Survey Laboratory. Uh, this presentation, we are going to have an overview about soil spectroscopy and interoperability. We're going to dive into the original publication, uh, the experimental design and the main takeaways of that study. And I'm also going to expand the idea or the, the, the insights in a different study we published uh, recently, a large-scale ring trial, and how uh, both studies, they can help us to improve the interoperability among MIR instruments. At the end of my presentation, I'm, I'm also going to talk about the Soil Spectroscopy for the Global Good Initiative. So let's get started. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, these two visualizations. The first is giving a focus on the infrared spectra. 
So the infrared spectra, uh, the wavelength is uh, in the nanometer, micrometer scale, and this type of energy interacts uh, with soils, uh, with the organic and inorganic compounds in the soils, the molecules. And usually we measure <coughs> the radiation, this infrared radiation using spectro spectrometers, spectro radiometers. We have a light source which emits the radiation on a soil surface, and this interaction uh, is uh, measured by the spectrometer. The diffuse reflectance or the absorbance is measured by spectrometer, and then we can analyze soil spectral signatures and uh, explore this uh, relationship in models in quantitative and qualitative ways. So in soil spectroscopy, we usually uh, have this common uh, spectral ranging, ranges for studying soils, divisible, which covers uh, 350 to 750 nanometers, the near infrared, in this range and but my presentation today will be more focused on the MIR range the middle infrared so it's a, a, a this mid infrared has more dense information about the organic and inorganic compounds of the soils and we can use that to explore in several situations so the idea of soil spectroscopy is to move from the wet chemist chemistry analysis. So for analyzing, analyzing soils, if a farmer, a researcher, a service provider is interested in understand what is, uh, what is the soil, what is going with the soil, usually we use these uh, reagents and uh, standard uh, methods, but the dry chemistry or soil spectroscopy has, uh, is a cleaner, cheaper, a more sustainable solution for uh, <clears throat> getting soil information. So with just a small fraction of a soil sample, we can scan uh, the soils and then get a multiple information uh, related to soil constituents. In the right side, we have a representation uh, of this type of information present in the spectra. We have here the range from 4,000 centimeters to 650 centimeters. And we can see the spectral signature of soils. For example, in yellow, we have a high calcium carbonate soil. We have in red, a soil with high organic carbon content and also a soil with a moderate clay content. And all these spectral, uh, all these different constituents, they, they can be seen uh, in these peaks, valleys, and they are all related to the vibrational and functional groups from, from the soils. So usually we explore these continuous spectra in, in, uh, in models uh, in chemo using chemometrics or machine learning. So we provide or feed a model or an algorithm with this uh, spectra to be able to predict or estimate some soil properties of interest like organic carbon. We usually have uh, a good accuracy uh, using the mid infrared for predicting carbon and clay and other soil properties like uh, chemical uh, constituents or nutrients. We Usually they are more indirectly related to those features present in the spectra, but we are still able to, to, get, to, to get some predictions. So the main topic of this presentation is the interoperability and why we are talking about that, because soil spectroscopy has been around for decades. It's not a novel technology, but more recently it has matured. We have many global soil spectral libraries or soil spectral libraries published and uh, available elsewhere. And uh, one of the largest one, which is public and uh, representing most of the uh, mostly US soils and some other countries is the USDA NRCS KSSL library. So uh, the KSSL MIR library has more than 80,000 uh, soil samples scanned and they usually use this type of instrument, like a big instrument, a gold, uh, uh, using gold standard procedures, uh, auto samplers, and uh, this equipment is like uh, costs is expensive, 
uh, costs about a few few hundred or a couple of hundred thousand dollars. But usually, when we are interested in in uh, in using soy factory field offices and uh, many other laboratories, they can have like this compact and uh, smaller versions of uh, of instruments like this. Uh, this one represented here is a smaller and cheaper version, compact. Uh, they are from the same manufacturer, but uh, although the, we we are measuring the same spectral range, usually uh, they they have uh, some slight difference. Okay, so that's why we we are concerned about this interoperability, about this integration, because we need to find a way to uh, leverage those big libraries available elsewhere. And that's why we published, uh, we developed this study. So it was published last year. We basically uh, tested the transferability of a large mid infrared soil spectral library from the KSSL to a smaller, uh, <clears throat> to a smaller uh, instrument, uh, mid infrared instrument. And how we did that? We used the KSSL, the big library to train models. We, we separate a small subset of samples to train models and also separate a small subset for, for testing the models and also calibrating a transformation matrix function uh, among those instruments. Okay, So we have in the test set uh, the spectra from the primary instrument, the KSSL, the spectra from the secondary instrument, like the, the Brooker Alpha, the compact, compact one, and also we applied a function, tested different functions and uh, subsets for aligning the secondary instrument to the primary one. And we can see here on the, on the right side that uh, usually the, the secondary spectra is misaligned with the primary, although they represent the, they are they have the same manufacturer and the same represent the same range. Usually there is some uh, some difference, but when we apply um, a transformation matrix, which is like a, we call a standardization or calibration transfer, we can properly uh, align here. So these blue shades, they represented the primary and the secondary aligned to the primary space. And we can apply like a regular preprocessing, for example, smoothing, calculating the first derivative. And we usually found like very good results with just regular preprocessing. Uh, when we compare both instruments. And in the bottom, we can see like a, these visualizations, how distinct they are. The red one is the secondary, the, the blue one, the dark blue one is the primary. And when we apply this transformation function, we, we see a better overlap. Okay, so what were the main takeaways of this first study published in the uh, Soil Science Society of America journal? So we found that for those spectrometers uh, from the same manufacturer, the spectral preprocessing using the first derivative was good enough uh, for uh, delivering uh, predictions, uh, robust predictions, especially when we use like, a more sophisticated machine learning algorithm. When we tested the spectral standardization using SST, a method, a, a specific method, we found like a performance edge for total carbon and pH prediction, but not for clay. So we can see here on the left, the orange lines, they represent like an improvement uh, of the predictions for total carbon. So we extrapolated the performance from the primary spectra, uh, achieved that similar performance as the first derivative for pH, but for clay, it, it didn't work. And uh, SST was the best algorithm for this uh, transformation and alignment between instruments. And we found that around 50 samples are uh, the optimal number for aligning or correcting those instruments. So these are the main takeaways. So what happened next? Uh, with this first study, we decided as part of the soil spectroscopy for global good, to develop a large-scale ring trial or inter-laboratory comparison. So this, uh, the first study was a base for a larger, a broader one, 
And at Woodwell, we, we prepared about 70, uh, 70 samples, soil samples, and we shipped it, those samples uh, around the world. Laboratories received uh, liquids of those soil samples, and they scanned using their MIR instruments and procedures. And we were able to, uh, and then they sent back the spectra to us. So we have here the global representation of those laboratories. Okay. And this is a visualization, an overview about uh, those laboratories and instruments participating in the ring trial. So in the first study, we had only the broker manufacturer, two different models, but with this large scale one, we expanded and then got like a, a samples or spectra from for Perkin Elmer, Agiland, Thermo Fisher, and this gave us a better representation of those different laboratories and conditions uh, for soil spectroscopy. We can see that uh, those instruments, they have different configurations, beam splitter, detectors, for example, they use different sampling accessories. So using the same set of uh, standard samples, we were able to assess and uh, analyze the, the, the similar, similarity among instruments. And how we did that? We, as I said, we prepared 70 samples uh, uh, here at Woodrow Coin Preserve Center. Then we, we sent to those laboratories. When we got back the spectra, the MIR spectra, we made sure it was looking good or harmonized, all those different laboratories. Like we uh, made sure it was being represented in a sealed absorption scale. The spectra was trimmed to this interval and spaced to two centimeters. From the previous study, we found that uh, 50 samples are necessary for uh, estimating the transformation, the calibration metric. So we separate 50 samples for that purpose. And other, the other 20 samples were used as independent test set for testing the, model, uh, the models calibrated with the full uh, KSSL library. And uh, yeah, we instead of using the full KSSL, we use this subset, like uh, 15,000 samples, uh, because to speed up processing and make uh, the analysis more uh, faster. But the samples, uh, this uh, subset is still very representative. We were very, uh, uh, we paid attention, like in terms of uh, selecting those samples. And we also tested different spectral pre-processing algorithms. We analyzed the, the original spectra. We applied the baseline of set correction, savitz golay first derivative, normalization with standard number variate, and also test the, the spectral standardization. And for the analysis, for the result analysis, we <clears throat> analyzed the internal performance of those separate 20 instruments. We analyzed the performance when we applied the big, large KSSL model to those different 20 instruments, and the KSSL is included there as well. And we also were able to cluster and analyze those 20 instruments and group them into some categories that share similar metadata information, for example, the manufacturer, the accessories, the internal optics. Okay, so what we got from, from the ring trial? So we have this representation, like for the KSSL MIR library. We have the representation red, the ring trial samples, fifth samples for calibrating the transformation metrics. And the green ones are the two test sets. We also saw that uh, the ring trial, they are not contained in the KSSL training library. So they are samples from the North American proficient test and the KSSL quality process uh, control samples. And we found that they cover or they represent different range of soil properties for total carbon, clay, pH, potassium. So uh, we, we don't see cl a clear evidence of a mismatch between the ring trials and the, the training KSSL library. And uh, these are like the first results. It's very uh, striking because I'm going to start here on the right side. So this is the original spectra from those 20 different instruments. They, are, they have a huge offset between them. So this is the same soil sample, but scanned using 20 different instruments. 
And when we apply a regular, uh, regular pre-processing, like standard number of rate, we can reduce some of those uh, dissimilarities. Although for some instruments, the, the, the spectra still looks very distinct. And when we apply the spectral standardization or the calibration transfer, they are basically the same, we see a better uh, match of the, the spectral curves and then we, we, we see like a, a better overlap and properly alignment of, of those different instruments with the KSSL. We analyzed uh, the spectral di diversity of these original uh, uh, returns, the, the, the MIR spectra, and we were able to cluster those 20 instruments in four different groups. And uh, so instrument 16 is the KSSL instrument. They are mostly represented by the Brook Vertex, like those big benchtop instruments, like cluster number four. We have other Brooker instruments in this cluster number three, but they are more compact and use different, different accessories. This one is also a Brooker instrument, but they use a very specific sampling accessory. And the green ones, the cluster number two, uh, they are mostly represented by other manufacturers like Thermo Fisher, Perkin Elmer, Agilent. So we were able to cluster and uh, separate those different instruments based on a spectral clustering uh, algorithm. And what do we found with this large scale ring trial? We found that, okay, these instruments, they can they are good when they are calibrated internally or for example if you're if they use their own soil spectral libraries the results for organic carbon clay ph potassium they are good right we found that organic carbon has a better uh, predictive performance than ph than clay and potassium and we also found some difference especially for clay comparing those different spectral preprocessing algorithms so clay was the most sensitive to spectral preprocessing, and we found in general that uh, Savitz Golai and standard norm of rate they are the best to remove noise and enhance the signal for the prediction. But when we integrated or we applied the KSSL library, the model from the KSSI library to those different 20 instruments, we we saw very uh, variable, high, high variable results. So uh, we found that uh, among the regular preprocessings, uh, SNV, the standard number of variate, was the best preprocessing algorithm. But for some case, for for very dissimilar instruments, spectral standardization helped a lot and was was necessary. We also found that in terms of uh, mo uh, machine learning algorithms or uh, model types. Uh, MEBL, Memory Based Learner, and Kubis, they delivered better predictions. And uh, so, yeah, those are the main takeaways. SST is necessary for highly dissimilar instruments, and Kubis and MEBL, they deliver more precise estimates when, the, when we combine those different instruments and libraries. And these uh, findings, they were recently published on Geoderma. So last week we got this paper, paper published. We are very happy because it was a very collaborative effort. More than 50 authors, the participation and the willingness to share data and participate in the ring trial network from more than 20 uh, laboratories. And many people are still uh, reach out to us to be part of that network. If you are interested in joining, we are very welcome you. And uh, so, yeah, that's it. So what were the conclusions from both studs and this interlaboratory comparison? So all instruments, they can deliver good predictions when they are calibrated internally. Uh, Pre-processing, in this case, standard number variate helps to reduce most of the variations but spectral standardization may be necessary when integrating contrasting instruments or libraries. More sophisticated model types like Kubis and MBL, they deliver bad predictions from the large KSSL library. And we hope that these findings, they can assist in the laboratories in build spectroscopy capacity for utilizing those public existing large MIR libraries.
especially the KSSL, and also we have now the, the OSSL, the Open Source Spectral Library, which has imported, uh, we have imported many uh, MIR libraries uh, like the KSSL, ECREF, uh, Lucas, and many others. So as we are reaching the end of this presentation, I just want to, to show you like uh, we have the, uh, we, we are part of this initiative, Soil Spectroscopy for Global Good. If you are interested in learning more about our work, uh, you can uh, access soilspectroscopy.org. You can follow us on Twitter or X if you are still there, SoySpec. And we have, with this project initiative, we have been publishing a lot of open results. We've been documenting all these modeling things, uh, the ring trial we stood. We've been publishing, uh, <clears throat> we published the open source spec library. We documented it in the OSSL manual. We also made available the OSSL in different ways. Uh, for example, we created this platform, the OSSL Explorer, where you can access this data. The KSSL is included there. And also we created the OSSL engine, which is an estimation service. So you can upload like spectra and get prediction backs uh, for different soil properties with uncertainty estimation, and also the representation flag. And I haven't provided uh, in, this pro in this presentation, but we have the GitHub, uh, GitHub organization account. So all the code and development is also publicly available there. So thanks so much for your patience, your time. Uh, Soil Spectroscopy for Global Good has been funded by USDA NIFA, and we've been developing this project, these ideas, with our colleagues from OpenGL Hub and Universe of Florida. So thanks so much again, and I'm open to any questions. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jose. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. So, um, first question, does it really make sense to pit wet chemical analysis against the spectral analysis? The interpretations of the spectral analysis must be based and calibrated to the chemical analysis. It is misleading to suggest that spectral analysis can stand alone. That's the first question and comment. Yeah, so <laughs> I think that's a good question. So for being able to explore those spectral variations uh, from these soil spectral libraries, we need to have reference data, right? So the reference data com comes from these wet chemist methods like uh, uh, dry combustion for determining carbon or the pipette method for determining clay. So some soil properties, they have a, a, a good correlation, like the spectra with the reference values, like the, the standard methods. Others, not that much. But uh, because some soil properties or some information we can see in the spectra, the spectral signatures, others not, they are more, more like indirectly related. So there, there, there are some uh, challenges for that. It's not like that straightforward. But uh, yeah, we can use different modeling uh, architectures. We can use different, uh, explore different ideas, and try to to get all this information from from the spectra. Thank you. So another question: Spectroscopy is affected by the moisture constant content in the soil. How do you manage this problem? Yeah. So my presentation was mostly focus on laboratory, benchtop laboratory instruments, uh, the field. Uh, so there are some uh, global initiatives like the, the FAUS Glosolan Global Soil Partnership. We are in that initiative, we are also cooperating, participating. We are trying to establish a standard operating procedures for laboratory, for the field, for integrating uh, satellite, aerial spectroscopy with laboratory. And the IEEE uh, working group is also advancing on that direction. So it's a uh, ongoing work trying to define all these standards and minimize these effects. For example, the moisture effects. We can, for example, I showed uh, we can, we are able to calibrate or to correct 
the effects of these dissimilarities among instruments, but the same methods can be used to correct or remove the effect of moisture and other factors in the spectra. So we need to use these standards, different levels of moisture, and then we are able to mathem mathematically remove those effects. <clears throat> I was muted. <laughs> oh, yeah. Were there any trials for producing spe spatial maps using the calibrated model? Uh, not so far. Uh, so yeah, this work was mostly focused on uh, like uh, spectra only, but the, the OSSL, we imported the special coordinates, we imported uh, sam the sampling locations, the dates, so not all the samples they have this information, but if you are interested in exploring the special variation of, uh, of the spectra or the properties estimated from spectra, you can use the SSL, we have provided this uh, site information. So yeah, uh, I think the, the soil spectroscopy can help us to improve the density of uh, sampling in the field, for example, rather than send, uh, collecting soils in the field and sending to a routine laboratory, you can increase your sampling and then just scan, scan your, your soil. And this will be cheaper, faster, and you're gonna have like a different quality of data and this can help a lot to understand uh, the landscape, the soil variations in the landscape. This was not the focus of our work, but other people, they can explore the OSSL and the KSSL for this special modeling. Well, connected to what you were just saying, uh, do you happen to know what is the cost of analysis per sample? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but some studies, they mention like a, a fraction, like a usually like 10% of a uh, traditional soil analysis. And uh, yeah, so usually it's like a fraction of the, 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 the cost. Another question is, can you explain a little bit more about what the SST process involves? Also, are there R packages available that can perform SST and MBL and QVIS method, prediction methods? That's, that's a very good question. So SST, spectral standardization transformation, it basically, we need to have the, the samples scanned in two instruments or two conditions. So we calculated the difference between them and employed this to a, a PCA, like a PCA uh, orthogonalization algorithm. And these metrics, uh, these transformation metrics is applied to the secondary or, so, it's a can be said it's based on the the, the, the PCA or these uh, orthogonalization algorithms, but there are other ways for doing that. Uh, this topic of spectral standardization or calibration transfer has been uh, explored a lot in the food industry. So other fields they 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 have other types of algorithms, and we can kind of explore these in soil spectroscopy. So the code for doing that is available on our GitHub account. Uh, there's a repository called the Ring Fry. You're, you're gonna find like all the processing code and the algorithm for the algorithms for feeding QBs, partial score regression, performing spectral standardization, those different uh, pre-processing. And there, there are some uh, pack, Python package who have uh, they, this package has a lot of uh, PyCal transfer as different algorithms just for this purpose, calibration and spectral standardization. Thank you. So another question is, will you use S and B as a routine processing method for comparing a spectra collected from different kinds of soils on the same instrument? I think like uh, we we have been observed, we observed that applying a smoothing algorithm, not changing or not like uh, calculating derivative, derivative, but if we apply a moving, smoothing algorithm in the spec to remove some of the white noise, you know, and then normalizing uh, with a standard normal variate, I think that's a, a good strategy for uh, correcting uh, 
the offset between samples and instruments and soy spectral libraries also enhancing the signal so we have problems uh, that comes from for example the effect of uh, particle size we have like this offset between instruments so SNV really works well for that purpose and but before SNV we also recommending applying like a smoothing algorithm because some instruments they have like a, a better uh, scanning condition than others so some of them are like more noisy than others so yeah removing the noise and then normalizing with SNV I think that's a, a good uh, pipeline for you know pre-processing spectra and for the most dissimilar case and then spectral sterilization may be necessary especially when we integrate like a uh, different manufacturers how do you do the baseline correction? Was it the manual correction or do you use an automated model? Yeah, well, baseline offset correction can be automatically done, like uh, subtracting the, the minimum value or dividing uh, each spectrum by their maximum value. So it's very straightforward. Like you estimate those statistics across the sample spectrum and then you just subtract or divide. And then you have this offset. But the SNV, uh, it, it's a normalization. So it uh, subtracts the mean of the spectrum and divide by the standard deviation. So we have like a, a offset correction and also the stretch or, or compression. So it changes a little bit. But still, uh, the information is the same, like the spectral variation. We, we can see the same absorption features because Sometimes first derivative changes a lot of the spectra and can be more uh, complex to interpret the model. So that's why I, I prefer SNV. Mm -hmm. Another question is what other soil parameters do you feel would strengthen these models? Is mineralogy useful? Yeah, I think like uh, we are talking a lot uh, about like uh, exploring spectral libraries for predicting uh, those common soil properties for plant analysis, soil analysis, for carbon monitoring programs. But of course, like there is a lot of potential for mi mineral uh, studies. For example, the spectra has those signatures related to inorganic materials like uh, silicates, iron oxides, so we can quantitatively explore and also semi-quantitatively like uh, calculating the ratios, the peaks, valleys. So yeah, there is a lot of opportunity for miner mineralogical uh, analysis using the spectra, the, uh, the MIR spectra. And another question is, what is the actual amount of soil contributing to the scan results? Is it enough to base field scale recommendations? Uh, I didn't get that, so... I think the main question is what is the size of the sample you're running and if it's if, if that sample is representative enough to base field scale recommendations for, for example, for nutrients. So yeah, so sample preparation. So usually we collect like soils in the field, like one kilogram of soil, and then we, we need to homogenize and prepare, dry, uh, dry it. Uh, prepares uh, as fine earth. For MIR, it's recommended to finally grind the soils to less than like uh, two micrometers. But it's possible, there are some studies uh, showing that we can use fine earth for MIR because MIR is very sensitive to particle size of the soil. So, yeah, and, and the amount of soil that is being loaded on those small cups is like one gram of soil so we need like this very good homogenization and preparation of soils and make sure we don't have like grains like sand grains on top of that surface so that we will impact the spectra so yeah these standard operating procedures they are very important to minimize so that's why in, the, in those studies we, we prepared by ourselves the soil samples we just analyzed the, the variations coming from the, those different laboratories in terms of scanning the soil. So we are very sure about uh, th those difference comes from the, the instruments and the standard operating procedures for scanning the soils, not the sample preparation. But this is a, another very important factor. 
Uh, do you follow standard Kellogg's lab uh, protocols for sample prep? Yeah, yeah. So the Kellogg Soil Serve Laboratory has published uh, the guide, so manual guides for the wet chemistry, like a, the traditional soil analysis, and also for the spectroscopy analysis. So you can Google and find all these resources and use because they are very like they they really use like good protocols for make sure they, they the, the scans are reproducible or repeatable on time and they they are good reference for emulating your procedures and one last question are there standard free solutions that could help to leverage legacy soil spectral libraries yeah, so uh, that's a good question because uh, I showed here uh, we can proper, properly align those instruments when we share those samples across laboratories. Unfortunately, uh, we need that, but there's some some solutions are coming out in the literature that we may we can create like synthetic samples, but the further research is still needed to evaluate if that works because we have a lot of uncertainty from other sources like uh, the sample preparation from the uh, reference uh, results so we need to be very cautious about that but literature is indicating but we still need to explore and understand more and uh, I think like uh, I can mention for example if you want to join our, our network get the samples in your laboratory we are very happy to share them uh, all, all the continents in the world have received, the, people are sharing those samples. And uh, at the same time, like if you are going to test models from KSSL or DSSL on your samples, it's always a good practice to have a small amount, like 5% of your samples with the reference value. So you can see if the, the performance is good, if your the, the models, those big models, they are like biased or not and also evaluate the uncertainty uh, prediction interval. So it's a, also a good practice to, to have like a small amount of your samples with reference values. So not like blindly trust all the predictions, okay? Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sapon. I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you again all for joining us today and for today's webinar and Dr. Sapanali obviously for sharing his research with us today. We would appreciate if you could complete the survey that will pop up after you close this webinar. As a reminder, the recording will be made available and sent to all attendees soon. Thank you again and have an excellent day. Thank you.